Today, I'm here with Matt Kafora, owner of seven profitable Orange Theory Fitness locations, each doing over seven figures, as well as an area director and franchise owner of four senior care facilities and the CEO of the dog training company, K9 Games, which is also doing seven figures and very profitable. I was forced to open a second location. From there, it exploded. Although the last two businesses have nothing to do with fitness, I felt it was worth sharing with you as the topic of this episode is all about creating systems that allow you to scale and have a business that can run without you. And since Matt can't be at 12 places at once, I believed he'd be an excellent guest for this topic. I ended up tearing both of my biceps. Literally can't do anything. Believe it or not, my business improved uh, during this time, which is, which is a huge credit to my team. Gym owners and fitness entrepreneurs, are you doing all you can to manage leads, improve retention, and build meaningful relationships with your clients? If not, UpLaunch can help. Built by gym owners for gym owners, they've proven battle-tested software and marketing campaigns that will save you time and increase revenue so you can focus on the important things in life. Find out whether CRM is trusted by gym owners worldwide. Schedule a free demo at useuplaunch.com today. Want to get inside access to the ad campaigns that have been used by some of the most successful fitness studio brands from all over the world? The ads they've used, the landing pages, texts, emails, videos, what their prospect journey looks like? All of that is available now in LRVT, which stands for Loud Rumor Virtual Training. Whether you're a rookie in the advertising game or a seasoned professional, LRVT is designed to help you and your team advertise like the best fitness studios on the planet. Each training is well produced, thorough, and based on proven campaigns that we've ran successfully over and over again. You'll also be a member of our community where you can ask questions and get support from our team as well as the many other studio owners that we work with. To get started, go to loudrumorvt.com. Again, that's loudrumorvt.com. Matt got started in the fitness industry when he was just 17 years old. Although he had a passion for fitness, he realized his passion for the business of fitness was much stronger. I enjoyed helping people, getting them in shape, uh, but was much better at sales than I was, uh, you know, getting people to their goals. I had a hard time caring a little bit more than they did. So I uh, moved into the sales side of things and very quickly moved into management after I was uh, able to teach people how to do the sales process. So that's kind of where it started and that's where it stays. Like many fitness studio owners, Matt got his start in the big box gym world. And what he's been able to do since then has been nothing short of remarkable. So I moved from the big box world um, and moved into the Orange Theory Fitness space. Started with one and grew to seven over just a couple years. Um, Orange Theory was a great model and from there it exploded. Uh, my first one actually forced me to open my second one because I was turning clients away because I was too busy. I mean, terrible problem to have, you know, but it was a problem for sure. Um, so I've stayed in that space and, and moving from the big box world to the boutique world has been a a very drastic change, uh, but one I, I welcomed and wouldn't ever go back to the big box world. He's not alone. Many studio owners that came from big box gyms have also shared that they'd never go back. But I wanted to get Matt's reasons as to why. I like the people connection of the, the boutique space as opposed to the numbers connection of the big box world. Um, you know, the, the people make Orange Theory, the people make the boutique space, and that's ju just the clients, that's the clients, that's the, the staff and the relationships that are built between. That's what really separates that, and I can, I can back that, I can get on board with that, because I truly do care about people, and them getting results, and then feeling like they're a part of something, and the culture that you're able to create in that small boutique space, as opposed to the big box where it's, you know, scan your card, you know, maybe I wave, maybe I don't, maybe I grunt, maybe I don't. Uh, not, not my cup of tea, I, I like the boutique space. Many studio owners have a hard time running just one studio successfully. It takes a great amount of work. Running seven seven-figure studios while also managing five other businesses, that takes a great team. And there's a difference between owning a business and running a business. Matt is an owner, and I want to learn more about the teams that he's built to run them all. So I have about 125 employees across all seven of my stores. Um, some full-time, some part-time. Uh, I have everything from my, my sales associates at the front desk to my coaches, to my head coaches, to my studio managers, to a regional manager as well. So that kind of is, is my, my org chart there, if you will. Um, but they, uh, they're all equally important in the, in the system. 
Uh, the business couldn't function without any one of those roles, and they're all very, very valued to what we do and to the experience that the members receive. Having 125 employees can be a lot of work, especially if you don't design a culture that gets each of them to give their best and not need to be told what to do and when to do it. I asked Matt what he does to create a culture of hardworking employees that truly care about the companies that they work for. It's a lot, um, especially when you know I'm in constant communication with certain employees more than others. Um, I do try to make it into all my locations and make sure I know everyone and they know me. Um, you know, and it's it's important to know your people because then you know what drives your people, what motivates your people, and then they actually care about the business when they care about you, and they see that you care about them. You know, so uh, building that that relationship and some sort of you know family atmosphere to where everyone feels that they're a part of something. You know, typically they don't leave when they're a part of something. I can tell you firsthand, Matt described his team perfectly. My wife Marjan and I each got a membership to their Lake Pleasant location in Peoria, Arizona. And most of the employees I've talked to have worked for Matt for many years and talk about him as if he were a good friend or a family member. They also did an incredible job representing his vision when he wasn't there, as they taught each class with enthusiasm and really worked hard to get every member to give their best. But obviously, Matt didn't start with 125 rock star employees. He started by himself and grew his team from there. And I want to know more about what that part of his journey looked like. Well, I started with, uh, I found coaches right away. Uh, so we start in a pre-sale space. So I, I signed my lease, signed my life away, and it was the first time I'd ever done that. Um, you know, pooled money, put my house on the line, that whole thing. So it was a burn the boat situation, right? I had to make this succeed, otherwise I had nowhere to live. I couldn't feed my kid, you know, all of these things. So it was really important that I, I, I owned that for sure. Um, but I started there and I found coaches. Um, and I found coaches knowing that I wasn't gonna be open for three, four months during my whole build out and the pre-sale process. But the coaches are what drives the business. That's the experience that the members receive and that's what I'm able to deliver with my product and my services. If I don't have that, I have nothing, right? So I start there. Um, I ran the pre-sale myself for quite some time, so I was out in the sun under a tent, you know, soliciting random people, soliciting businesses, signing up members and things like that. Um, I was able to bring someone else on at that point in time and you know help assist with the pre-sale process. Again, I'm thinking I need to control my payroll. Um, you know, I, I don't have an income at that point. I've, I've burned the boats and this has to work. Um, so I started there. Uh, once the business grew, um, you know, I, I worked in the store quite a bit as the studio manager, if you will. Had my coaches had my sales associates to help you know, offset the hours and things because of course I can't do everything, although I tried. Um, you know, and then from there I was able to, to grow it and scale it and then I brought in a manager uh, to oversee that store as I went on for pre-sale number two. Like many entrepreneurs, I've made many mistakes and learned from them all. And I talked with Matt about his first pre-sale and last pre-sale to see what he's learned and improved along the way as he's incredible at this part of his business and opens each of his locations with hundreds of paying members that stick around for longer than the average studio member. The, the first pre-sale was, was an eye-opening experience for me. Like I said, I, I burned the boats. I had nothing you know, um, as far as other streams of income. This was it. This was the only thing that I had. And now I'm going on a three or four month you know, income hiatus, if you will. You know, and, I, and I knew I had to make it happen. And I did it. But I failed. I struggled. You know, it was uh, it was hard. You know, I tripped over a lot of a, a lot of stones in that process. Um, I actually opened up my first studio with 185 paying members. Um, I didn't know if it was good or bad. I didn't. I I knew I needed more. Um, but 185 paying members hurt my heart. Uh, you know, within 12 months, we were kissing a thousand members at that point. So the exponential growth was insane. Um, I wish that would have started at 500 members or more, and I couldn't imagine where that studio would be now. Um, but what did I learn through that process was, you know, I was, I was scared. I was scared financially because I needed to hoard whatever money I had, um, and I was scared to, you know, invest in some marketing. And you know, had I, could I go back and start from one again? Um, that's exactly what I would have done. Is you know, if it cost me, you know. X amount of dollars in marketing month one and month two and month three and month four and that ramps up and that grows, do it. 
do it. It's worth every penny, right? And I know you're sitting there, you know, nodding your head and shaking, but it's true. You know, um, I wish I would have known that, you know, six years ago when I started that, as opposed to I'm so scared about the money and the income that let me try and hold on to this and let me see if I can pound the pavement and beat the streets because that's the mindset that I was so used to with the big box. Let me go flyer. Let me go do door hangers. Let me, right. you know, see if I can get out in front of the masses that way. Um, I didn't do very well with that as far as you know numbers goes, um, and I wish I would have invested more in, in the marketing dollars and invested more, um, you know, in, in conjunction with the the pound the pavement guerrilla marketing, if you will. The pre-sale can be a make or break part of any business. Many businesses run out of money before their doors even open, and being able to start day one in profit is an incredible way to kick things off. Matt, as well as many other successful fitness studio owners, believe in investing more marketing dollars during those three to four months prior to opening to make sure that this happens. How much do you think Matt invests per month during his pre-sales? Uh, I, I would do truly at least $10,000 a month. Um, and, and you know, for a lot of people in, in this boutique space, you know, whether it's their first store or second store, that probably sounds like a little bit more and just insane amount of overkill because you're dropping thirty, forty thousand dollars in a pre-sale process. So you don't see that return for you know however long. But the ROI on that number is insane. Right. You know, just to kind of put things in perspective, my my seventh pre-sale as opposed to my first pre-sale, my seventh pre-sale was five times better than the first one. Um, you know, and I, and I still think the pre-sale could have been better from there, but right. you know, five times better than pre-sale number one. Right. It's nuts. $10,000 per month probably seems like a lot of money, and it is. But if Matt spends $30,000 over the three months prior to opening, and that $30,000 generates 500 paying members, which is something that every Orange Theory fitness studio owner aims to open with, and those members pay about $150 a month, that's $75,000 of monthly recurring revenue. Not a bad way to open your doors, especially when your overhead is most likely under $30,000 per month. This difference in profit allows you to continue that level of marketing so you can inevitably double that member count as Matt has. But you don't wanna spend your money blindly. You want to invest it in the marketing avenues that have the highest and quickest return with the least amount of effort. So the mass market is is where it's at, right? I've done the guerrilla marketing. That's the that's the world that I came from. I still think that's tried and true, um, despite where technology's gone, despite the the Facebook and the Instagram and the YouTube and you know all of those things. I think those are you know insanely important and exponentially you know better as far as you know getting a return on it. But there's something to be said for the you know, client engagement face to face to, you know, getting out to parking lots and beating the street that way, door hangers. Uh, you don't get the return that you do from, you know, the, the social media platforms and things. And I think dollar for dollar, it's still something you need to do. You need to touch that space. Uh, but primarily my marketing dollars would be spent to, you know, allocate those towards the social media platforms for sure. Uh, you can just touch so many people and then engaging those people and the people of those people and those people's people, uh, you know, it just makes a lot more sense. Um, so I would probably allocate 70% of that right. towards the, uh, the social media space. Digital marketing is a tool of giants for people like Matt and many others that have led the way for fitness studios all over the world. And conferences like GSDCon and programs like Loud Rumor VT allow studio owners to learn exactly how to do this right so you get the best use of every dollar you spend. That brings me to the next important step, sales. You can have a great marketing campaign, but if your sales game isn't strong, you may find yourself wasting money. A few months back, I interviewed $4.4 .4 billion ad agency owner, Jordan Zimmerman. Listen to what he said when I asked him about this. Do you ever have uh, brands that you work with or have you had brands that you work with that have so much potential and you run great ads for and all the marketing does this job, but the sales process that they have afterwards is somewhat broken or not as sophisticated? Mike, you already know the answer. I know. I'm helping Absolutely. <laughs> Listen, you know, great advertising to bad brands right. doesn't work. Right. Okay, I'd rather have okay advertising to great brands. At least I know it'll work. Operationally, a brand has to be set up. A brand has to be ready for digital traffic and the conversion of that digital traffic through their BDC, their business development centers. Okay, back to Matt. Let's dive into his process on how he converts his digital leads into paying members. 
it's all about the organization. Um, you know, you and I spoke earlier about you know how you do one thing, you do all things. Uh, the OCD that I have, um, it's crazy, right? So, but organizing those things and being so OCD with them, again, I go back to my days where I, I didn't have the income and I didn't have the money, and it's like, okay, if I get a hundred leads. I can't not stop calling these leads. I can't afford to not call these leads. I can't afford to lose one lead. You know, I, I need to follow up with those. I need to stay consistent with those. I need to, you know, continuously touch them to ensure that nothing falls through the cracks. Mm -hmm. So truly it's the organization of putting the systems in place to be able to grow and scale that, whether it's 10 leads, 100 leads, 10,000 leads, and again, based on those marketing dollars, that's the goal is to make those leads come through, right. you know, at crazy numbers. You've probably heard the phrase, the fortune is in the follow up. And I believe this to be true. This goes for the speed in which you follow up, the quantity and the quality. Speed. A study done by MIT proves that you have a 900% greater chance of making contact with a form lead if you call within the first five minutes. Quantity. More than 80% of sales are made between the 5th and 12th contact, yet more than 84% of salespeople and business owners admit to discontinue their follow-up by the 3rd contact. And quality. Companies like mine and Matt's use different ways to reach out to leads to make it fun and different. He'll talk about that later in the episode. But before we get into that, let's hear what his sales process looks like end-to-end, -end, as Matt's made it a real team effort at his companies. <laughs> the sales process starts from the very beginning, the very first time that they're touched. So that engages my entire team. Um, are there people that are designed and designated to complete the sales process? Yes. Uh, but every single person on my team understands and is a part of the sales process because that client of mine touches every single person in there and everything is a sale. So the first point of contact is my sales associate typically. Um, you know, they're fielding the phone calls, they're greeting the guests, they're, you know, going through their goals and finding out what's, what we can do to help them. Uh, from there, my coaches touch it. That's what, that's what delivers our product. You know, the sales associate talks to the coach and says, hey, this is Mrs. Jones's goal. You know, Mrs. Jones needs help. You're the fitness professional, help Mrs. Jones out. Mrs. Jones goes through the workout with, you know, one of my coaches. The coach comes back out, prescribes to them, you know, hey, Mrs. Jones, based on your goals, here's what we need from you, hands it back to my sales associate, who then presents the different membership options based on their goals. The studio manager gets involved for any assistance that's needed. Again, I want familiar faces. I want the client to know everyone. The cheers atmosphere is what separates the boutique from the big box. That's what keeps people there. I want Mrs. Jones to know every single person in there, and I want every single person in there to know Mrs. Jones, know her kids, how was Billy's soccer game, you know, what's going on with the vacation, where are we at with your goals? I want all of those things. So to answer your question, yes. Yes, everyone is a part of the sales process because they need to be. Having a cheers atmosphere, meaning everyone knows your name and there's a real community in the business, isn't easy to do. And when you have a thousand members, having all your employees know every member's name can be a tough request. So how does Matt ensure that this happens at each of his locations? When a client comes into me, they, unbeknownst to the client oftentimes, they are giving us the responsibility of their goals. Um, and that's something that I chat with my team all the time about is when Mike walks in, it's no longer Mike's job to get to Mike's goals. It is now our job. Mike has now entrusted us with getting him to his goals. So what does he need? Some guidance, accountability, motivation, you know? And if they don't genuinely care about you and care about your goals, you're not gonna get there. Unfortunately, people don't always love working out. It's hard, you get sore, it's painful, it's an hour out of your day that you don't get back. You know, we all know we need to do it, but it's not always at the forefront of everyone's brain. So how can we make this enjoyable? How can we provide that support system? How can we show that care to show that we truly, truly want Mike to get to his goals? We have to care. You don't care, we're in the wrong business. It's a people business. It's a people business, otherwise known as a relational business. A few weeks back, we launched one of our most popular GSD story episodes with Bedros Koulian, founder of Fit Body Bootcamp, a franchise approaching a thousand locations. He too believed studio owners need to see it this way. 
So it all starts there, vision, mission, values. So are they hardworking? Are they ethical? Do they believe in fitness? Or do they just wanna make money from a franchise? If that's the case, there's Jiffy Lube and there's Subway. Go be a sandwich artist or change oil in a car, right? That's a transactional business. We are in a relational business. And so for someone to say, hey, look, in their application, I wanna make lots of money. And I'm, all, I'm a capitalist, man, like I love money. Money is a vehicle to freedom. Money helps me help the causes that I believe in. But this is a service industry. It's transformational what we do, not transactional. When you get a chance, I strongly recommend going back to catch the full episode with Pedros as it's a fan favorite. Okay, back to Matt, who by the way, has an incredible sales process. Too many times I hear people shy away from sales as they don't believe sales and customer service are in the same family. I believe the exact opposite, and so does Matt. Let's dive into his sales process and how he enhances a member's experience during it. We call the leads immediately. Um, nights, weekends, whatever. Strike while the iron's hot. Obviously your goal is important to you at that point in time. If it's seven o'clock at night, it's seven o'clock at night. Guess what, Mike, it's important to you then, and now it becomes important to us then, right? It's important at that point. From there, you don't answer the phone. You're busy, you're eating dinner, you did it while you're in line, whatever. No problem. Let me send you a follow-up text. Early in this episode, I shared that the quality of your follow-up was important, and being creative can go a long way with your leads compared to just checking in every time. I promise you that later in this episode, Matt would explain how his team follows up creatively. So, here we go. The texts for me have evolved. We started out with a follow-up text. Hey, Mike, we missed you. You know, would love to get you booked. Seems like you're interested, blah, blah, blah that whole thing. Um, our texts have evolved. We, we've, we've gotten a lot more creative with them and we've seen much better feedback with them. So what we've done is we've really personalized it. Again, a text message is cool. My dentist sends them to me as well. Hey, Matt, you have a filling tomorrow. And I'm like, oh man, that's terrible, <laughs> right? So uh, I don't want to be a dentist office. Right? Fitness is not the dentist office. Any dentist, I apologize. Uh, you know, but it's not a dentist office. It needs to be Disneyland. It needs to be something that's enjoyable because to most people it's not. So how can we make this enjoyable? How can we make it personal? How can I show that I care about Mike's goals? Well, what we've done now, Mike, is we've, we've created something to where, yes, we send a text message. We send a text message with members of my team saying, hey, Mike, and we talk to you. You know, we're talking to you. We send you a video. We send you a boomerang. We have something personalized for you. So again, it goes back to the organization because that's important. So we get a certain number of leads. You know, we always need and want more leads, but why wouldn't we invest the time and energy into the ones that we have to ensure that we're gonna get the most bang for our buck? So let's personalize it. Let's really reach out and touch Mike's heartstrings at that point. I'm gonna leave it the Disneyland voicemail. I'm gonna be, you know, over the top, excited, energized, engaged, and asking you, hey, where you at? You express mm -hmm. some interest, let's get you in here. From there, again, it's the text message with the video, with the boomerang, with, you know, something exciting and personalizing it for you. I'm gonna keep following up, Mike. You've now given me the responsibility of your goals. You've entrusted me with getting you to your goals. Whether you are aware of it or not, you have from when you submitted your name and number and your email to me, it's now my job to get you in here. It's now my job to get you to your goals and my team embraces that mindset. So I'm gonna keep calling you. I'm gonna keep sending you text messages. We're gonna get creative with it. Mike, where you been? We haven't mm -hmm. seen you, man. We're so excited for you to get in here. Right. You know, it's been two weeks. Guess what? You could have burned X amount of calories with us in two weeks. We could be down this far. Where are you at? Let's get you in here. You know, we're, we're sharing a little bit of knowledge. We're sharing a little bit of that, that guidance, that motivation, and we're personalizing it. We're trying to touch your heart through that text message, through that phone call, through that voicemail, through that email, and I'm gonna keep reaching out until you tell me, hey, Matt, I'm not interested. Mike, we were interested at some point. So when you're ready to be you know, interested again, you let me know, I'm gonna reach back out to you in 30 days. Right. You know, and it's, it's, again, it's our job. So I think once everyone embraces that mindset of, you've now entrusted me with getting to you to your mm -hmm. goals, whether you are aware of it or not as the client, you have. So once they embrace that and we show the care, it, that's what's seemed to go very, very well for us. Matt and many other successful studio owners I speak with send text messages with personalized videos in it. 
but it did learn that this process has a glitch. If you're sending iPhone to iPhone or Droid to Droid, for example, the video comes out perfectly. But if you send a video text from an iPhone to a Droid, sometimes the quality distorts quite a bit and it really ruins the experience. My team uses a free app that you can download on your phone and it's called Vidyard Go Video. You can just as quickly shoot a video through the app and send it to anyone in a text without worrying about losing quality. We video text a lot here at my company and it works extremely well. Okay, so that's an example of quality follow-up. We also talked about the importance of speed and quantity of follow-up. Matt broke this part down for us too. Leap comes in the morning, you're there in the morning, your job to call immediately, you know, five minutes, call them, get them in there. You know, they're excited then, we're excited then, get them in. You don't touch them in the morning. My evening team comes in. Guess what, Mike was excited this morning. He's probably at work today. I called him, I texted him, let's touch base with him one more time today and ensure that we can try and reach out to him because again, it's our responsibility now to get Mike to his goals. He's excited, we're excited for him. We'll follow up the next day. And the next day, for about the first week, we're gonna touch you every day. You know, you were excited then. We're just as excited and motivated to get you in because they're your goals. After that, maybe we scale it back to, you know, three or four days a week. Um, but I'm still touching, Mike. I still want to be at the forefront of your brain. You know, with marketing, we need seven to eight touches before, okay, I'm ready. I need those touches. Keep touching, keep touching, keep touching. Something may spark it because you're going to get back on Facebook at some point. You're going to be scrolling through. Oh, hey, this is the, this is, okay, I'm ready for it. I see Orange Theory. They've called me three times. They sent me the cool text. They sent me the funny guy doing this and that in, in my video. Okay the final touch, you know, but we'll keep going like that. And I'll still touch them all three or four times a week, you know, 30 days later. Right, right. You know, we'll still touch with the, the phone calls and the text messages and the emails. Again, until that person says, I no longer want you responsible for my goals, mm -hmm. I'm still responsible for them. Right. So why do the best work so hard to follow up with leads? Why work so hard for just one sale? Well, there are a few reasons. One reason many don't think of is that that one sale that you make today could be the sale that changes your business. It could be the member that refers you to their boss and he signs up 60 of his employees with you in a corporate deal, or a member that eventually becomes your best employee and sells memberships better than anyone you've ever had. I've signed up customers that are worth 80 customers when it comes to how much they spend and how much they refer to my business. The other reason we work so hard for a sale is because we've done the math and learned what the real lifetime customer value is for our members. Once you really know that number, it's hard not to follow up consistently as you really feel the money you're leaving on the table. There are a few different ways to break that member value down, so let's see how Matt does it. Well, we, we break it down based on, obviously, the membership type that we sell. Um, you know, uh, based on our membership numbers, you know, each of these clients, we, we keep a client anywhere between eight and 10 months on, on average um, at $159 a month, mm -hmm. you know? So um, I have no problem with my, my lead acquisition costs at, you know, $20, mm -hmm. you know? Um, of course, I'd like it lower right. all the time, right? But based on the ROI on that, you know, and it's my team's job to retain them longer than that, you know? And the, the analogy that I that I give to my team is the water bucket. I'm sure you've heard it before, mm -hmm. right? So it's it's my team's job to continuously pour water in the top of the bucket. Inevitably, there's a hole at the bottom of the bucket. People leave for whatever reason. They get sick, family issues, financial issues, whatever. Um, the goal is to continually pour the water in that bucket, and then I provide the marketing dollars um, as well as their guerrilla marketing outside to to drive the traffic to be able to pour the water on top of that bucket. So um, you know, breaking down the lead costs and things. I'm less concerned about that and more concerned about client retention because again, it's delivering on our promise that we make. It's you know fulfilling the the responsibility that we have for those client goals. So um, the acquisition cost is less important to me because I know once they're there, I can retain their business. I can retain them as a client because we care. I can get them results because that's what Orange Theory does. Mm -hmm. You know, we are we're a results-based business. You know, um, when people see results, they don't quit. You know, go to work and get a paycheck, you're, you're gonna go back to work. Getting your members to ascend to bigger packages that cost more as a whole, but less per session, is a great way to increase lifetime customer value. The top studio owners do their best to move prospects into their premium packages right from the beginning. 
But for those members that started smaller, people like Matt and his team continue to keep an eye on them and look for opportunities to bump them into the highest tier, where the business can earn more money and the member can gain better results faster. There's tiered memberships. Um, and again, it's always gonna be based on the client and what their goals are and what they need. Uh, sometimes we do um, you know, need to upgrade a member. Their goals don't change, but maybe they're finding themselves using things more often. So instead of buying additional sessions through me, my teams are trained to do what's right for the member. Mm -hmm. From a business standpoint, it makes way more sense right. for them to continue purchasing additional sessions from me. I'm gonna make more money on it. Uh, from a morality standpoint, do what's right for the member so they stay with us, so they become walking billboards for us. If we're doing what's right by them, we're gonna save them the money. Mm -hmm. It's the world's easiest sale at that point. Hey, did you wanna save some money? Sure. Another way to increase your lifetime customer value is to retain your members for longer. Every additional month they stay with you increases your value by that much more. There are many things that can negatively affect retention. The most popular reason being they're just not getting results. The next most popular reason is employee turnover. Their favorite instructors and their coaches that kept them motivated begin to leave. And just when they get used to the new coach, they leave. And this can be terrible for member experience, thus really hurting retention. So how does Matt keep his coaches and instructors for so long to make sure he eliminates this type of negative impact? So some of my coaches have been with me, I think my longest coaches have been with me for about five years um, since the Lake Pleasant location actually opened. Wow. Um, pretty cool to think about that they've, they've enjoyed their time with, with me, with Orange Theory, and more importantly with my members for that long. I mean, especially in the fitness industry, in that space, that's unheard of for people to stay around that long. Um, I try to interact with them. I, you know, they, they know me, I know them. Um, you know, one of my coaches has been with me for five years. Like I said, I just reached out to him the other day. Every time I'm in the store, I seem to have missed him based on his schedule. Just shot him a quick text the other day. Hey, haven't seen you for a little bit. How are you? How's the family? How are things? Zero work related. It's not, hey, you need to do this or what's happening there. It's truly, hey, how are you? I haven't talked to you for a little bit. Are you right. doing okay? How's the family? How's the kids? You know, I, I truly think those little touches, again, we talk about caring about our members. You know, we have the internal, external customers. Those are my internal customers. You know, they, they at the end of the day, you know, are, are my people. You know, you don't care about your people, they're not gonna stay. The first step to building a great team of employees is creating a vision of what you want your culture to look like. A few episodes ago, we had author of The Vivid Vision, Cameron Harold on, where he explained step-by-step step how to do this. Once you have the vision, you are constantly hiring people that fit that vision and developing employees to fit it better and better each day. My team kind of goes by the mantra, train them or trade them, right? So I think it goes back to, I always look to myself and my team first. Are we doing everything that we possibly can to ensure my success? If not, it's on us. So training. Right, Our, we take a very systematic approach to it. Over the past six or seven years that I've you know had all these locations, it has streamlined itself. You know, with the help of the franchise, but more importantly, you know, I've created a, a pretty systematic approach to train everyone from my sales associates to my coaches to my managers to the point where there's even a binder. Anybody can walk in and learn exactly what to do and walk through step by step by step. And I think that's how I've been able to scale and scale to a point that everyone is on the same page. So everyone has a, an interchangeable cog piece, if you will. Um, I can move you from one location to another location and nothing's gonna skip a beat because the systems are the same. You know, while the, while the people are different, systematically you're running the same business time and time and time again. So uh, to be able to train you know, my managers that way, to be able to train my sales associates and my coaches that way is really important. One of my favorite books and a favorite amongst many entrepreneurs is The E-Myth Revisited by Michael Gerber. Michael explains that people shouldn't run a company. Great systems should run a company and great people should run the systems. People like Matt understand the importance of this and live by it. Having great systems and training on those systems dramatically increases the likelihood of your employees doing great work. But what happens when you do come across an employee that refuses to follow systems or just can't seem to keep up with the other employees no matter how much you train them? So oftentimes, um, 
it, it's an honest conversation. Nine times out of ten, they know that it's coming because we're we're big on goal setting. Um, so I sat down with my managers at the beginning of the year, and you know we talked about goal setting. So I said, Mike, I want to know three personal goals for you. And I want to know three professional goals for you. What are we looking to accomplish this year? And again, going back to knowing your people and genuinely caring about your people. You know, I had some people who, hey, I want to, you know, invest, you know, this amount of money into my retirement this year. So guess what? We've touched on that a couple times. Hey, we're, we're a quarter of the way through the year. Where are we at with this? How can I help facilitate this? Do you want my financial team? Do you, what, what, what can I do for you? How can I serve you? Um, I know I have a lot of the right people, right? So... Maybe they're not in the right seat on the bus. Maybe I can use them in a different capacity. If not, that's okay. You know, because these measurable goals, they understand that a lot of times they'll come to me and say, hey, I'm not meeting my goals. I'm not meeting my expectations. It's nothing that you've done, nothing that you haven't provided to me. Uh, I, I think I need to do something in a different area because I don't want to let you or the business or my team down. Um, and I think that's a, that's a very hard conversation for someone to have. That's a very hard look in the mirror to have. And it's awesome. It's awesome as a person to be able to sit there and say, I can't do this. This isn't for me. It's not, it's not anyone else's fault. It's just not a good fit. I can't do it. Um, and oftentimes we have those conversations and those conversations happen before I even have to say anything, which is, which is great. You know, it, it means that I know I hired the right person at heart and they're just not a good fit. Having these honest conversations can only happen if your employees are scored and measured. They have to know if they're meeting expectations just as much as you do. Otherwise, your honest conversation can come as a total shock to them. I asked Matt about how he measures the different employees at his studios. I mean, obviously each employee is measured differently based on, you know, what, what department they're in and what their job title and skill set is. Uh, sales associates pretty easy right they have they have leads to generate they have you know calls to make and at the end of the day sales to make right so pretty easy to break that down uh, what's a little bit more difficult are my coaches coaches don't have necessarily that same scorecard but they have the retention scorecard they have the how full your classes scorecard they have are you meeting the the corporate standards and the the metrics and the parameters that i set to ensure that we're delivering the best possible product and the best possible experience to our members. Mm -hmm. You know, my managers, they're overseeing the entire operation there. Same thing, hey, it's sales, it's retention, it's, you know, how happy are your staff? Are we retaining our staff? Where are we at with all of those things? So everyone has a little bit different scorecard, but at the end of the day, it's about the experience, right? So the better the experience from the, the sales associates for those members, the more members will gain from there. The better the experience for the members through the coaches, the more members will be in the coaches' classes. Mm -hmm. You know, the better the experience for the team, the better the numbers look for the studio manager. When it comes to salespeople, they're the easiest to measure and the most difficult to manage. In many sales-focused organizations, the best salespeople are often paid more than some of the C-level executives. At my company, I find this to be true as well. Sales is hard, and most people are either afraid of doing it, don't want to do it, or can't do it. And finding people that aren't afraid, want to do it, and do it extremely well should be paid appropriately. I wanted to see how Matt compensates his salespeople. We do commissions. We do hourly plus commissions. Um, I think that's really important because people like to be rewarded. People like to be rewarded for their work. Um, I don't want people to stress about money, so they're always the, the hourly, the base pay. My experience with this industry as a whole is you don't want the base pay too high because then people kick back and relax. Uh, you don't want it so low that you know we're strapped and, and st stressed for money and strapped for cash sort of thing. So uh, finding that balance right there. But commissions are important, you know, because people want to be paid what they're worth, and it gives them that drive factor to get out and do more, mm -hmm. to reap the benefits of their hard work. There's nothing better than my sales associates coming in, high five me when I walk in and say, Matt, I did this today. And I'm like, man, that's awesome. You know, I walked in and one of the girls told me the other day, you know, my commission check just wasn't wasn't what it normally is. You know, and again, it's it's we're talking an 18, 19 year old girl at this point saying, hey, I had a hard look in the mirror and I said, my my check isn't what it normally is. You know, I need to step up my game. Mm -hmm. That's not a conversation that I had. That's a conversation that she had with herself. And I was privy to that when she told me that. 
it's a pretty cool thing to hear when they say, I know I need to do better. Here's my plan. Let me share this. From there, I'm applauding every victory that she has. And she's proud of those victories then. She wants to tell me more. She wants to win. Innately, people want to win. They don't want to lose. They want to be good at what they do. They want to be good at their job. It's my job and my manager's job to play that support role, to pat them on the back, to high five them, to celebrate their victories. And by doing so, I build that emotional bank account with them. Because every 10 pats on the back, inevitably I'm going to have to give them a kick in the butt. Right. But if I don't have that 10 to 1 ratio, I'm always kicking them in the butt. Right. Their experience is bad. They don't stay. I'm doing a poor job retaining my team and providing a good experience to them. A feedback tracker is a real thing to focus on. I learned this lesson the hard way. I used to have pretty bad employee turnover and couldn't figure out why. I paid well, gave vacations and benefits, and we had a cool place to work but my employee turnover was still pretty bad. I then had a coach tell me to create a feedback tracker, just a simple spreadsheet that listed all of my employees in the left column. Then the next column was a spot where I could notch positive feedback, and the column after that was to notch constructive feedback. I realized that I was at a three to two ratio, three being constructive and two being positive. My coach encouraged me to adjust it so that I'm at a three to one ratio where I had three positive things to say for every one piece of constructive feedback. It was hard to do, and I'd be lying to you if I didn't tell you I was feeling a little inauthentic at times, as the real me just wanted to focus on the problems that needed to be fixed. But I worked at it, and before I knew it, I was authentically at that 3 to 1 ratio that I was aiming for. I built habits on purpose to get there, and the culture has never been better. This was a recommendation that was made to me, and I'll pass on to anyone else looking to raise culture in their business. And when you do these things and build a great team like Matt did, you have the people that you need to expand your business properly. Since Matt has seven profitable fitness studios, I wanted to get his insight on when he knows it's time to expand and how to do it successfully. I was forced to open a second location. Initially when I started, I thought I was gonna do two or three. Um, the first one did poorly with the, with the pre-sale, right? We discussed that. From there, it exploded. Um, again, I attribute that to the coaches and the systems that we had in place. The experience that the members received, uh, it exploded to the point where you signed up as a member. I couldn't get you in for classes for a week, two weeks. I was actually losing people because they could not utilize their membership. Again, you know, haha, it's a good problem, but it's a real problem. You know, my, my revenue actually decreased because I got too full. Um, it was bad though. I mean, truly, in the social media age, like, it's bad. People right. are, are complaining about their experience because it was too full. So that led to my second location less than a year later. Um, out of necessity, truly, and it was kind of a, a release valve that you know I was able to open that up, get it open as fast as possible, and it's you know 10 minutes away to where, okay, we can kind of normalize things a little bit more. Um, so when is, it, when is it time to open another location? You know, that one happened out of necessity. When is it time, and my best advice that I can give with that is when one is so, so secure and functioning so well that you can duplicate processes. If that means you're in it and you make up your business, you can't duplicate it. And that's the hardest thing that I've seen and when I've talked to people is, you know, if they are so much a part of the operation, it makes it difficult to duplicate. Mm -hmm. Find somebody, train them, get them 80% what you are, and then you can go do it again. Mm -hmm. If you can't duplicate you through systems and processes, the second, third, eighth, 15th location is going to fail. If you've ever watched an episode of Shark Tank or CNBC The Profit, you've already caught on to how much weight they put on the entrepreneur really knowing their numbers. And every coach that I've ever had has challenged me to really understand them too. Matt Cafora is a real numbers guy. I'm crazy about my numbers, so I look at them quite often, right? I look at my, my some of the financials on a daily basis. Um, again, it's my scorecard. It's my scorecard for my teams because I like to communicate with them where they're at, where they need to go based on where they're at. 
Um, and I like to know where we're at and how I can improve and what I need to fix and work on to ensure the success of my team. Mm -hmm. uh, so I look at certain things uh, every day as far as that goes. Um, my actual P&Ls I look at you know, every two weeks, every month, um, and ensure that nothing's out of the ordinary. If I have anything trending up or down, I want to look at things and ensure that I can maximize or minimize based on where we're going. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that's truly it. I mean, just owning your numbers is so, so important. I talk to a lot of people who don't know where they're at. And I, j I can't fathom how if you don't know where you're at, then how do you game plan where you're going to go? I don't know how to plan my day unless I'm able to see certain parts of my financials and know where I'm at. Mm -hmm. You know, how, how are you going without seeing that is, is beyond me. Okay, so if you don't know your numbers well already, you've probably made the decision to do so. But what numbers should you be looking at and what benchmarks should you be aiming for? The expenses are going to more or less stay the same as far as, as far as payroll and my hard costs and things like that. Um, you know, I like to operate in that 30-40% margin. Um, you know, and depending on the month and depending on the location, all of those things. But that's truly the bottom line. I, mean, I need to be right around there to A, sustain business, to B, grow business and then ensure that you know we're, we're staying successful and I'm able to continue the successful trend. You know, but that's that's the sweet spot in this space. Um, you know, some are lower than that, some are higher than that, but that is truly right where it needs to stay. I was a part of entrepreneur groups called EO and EO Accelerator, and that's where I first learned the phrase, revenues for vanity, profits for sanity, and cash is king. At the end of the day, how much cash your business is making truly determines if your business is winning. And that's what Matt is talking about here. When you have a service-based business, your biggest expense is always going to be people. And if you don't manage your team and salary cap appropriately, you may find yourself running out of cash quickly. I like to keep my overall salary cap under 40% unless I'm investing in revenue generating employees that will temporarily set me over salary cap until they begin earning that profit back into the business. I asked Matt what he aims for in regards to the salary caps in his fitness studios. Yeah, I mean, I'd probably say around uh, between 30 and 40. Um, you know, and I think, again, that's kind of the sweet spot. If you, I want to make sure my people are compensated for what they do. Um, again, I think that attributes a lot to them staying for, for a longer term and enhances the member experience because of that. Um, I also don't want people to become complacent either. So kind of finding that sweet spot um, and, and really kind of breaking it down from there, I think is important. Paying your people well is definitely one way that helps retain them for longer. Bonuses are another great way to compensate employees when going above and beyond what was expected of them. Matt has a lot of great ideas around bonusing his team when they surpass expectations. I think bonuses are really important. Like I said, I think people, people want to be compensated and people want to feel like they're rewarded for winning. So we've done everything from you know, setting annual goals. And if that's a certain revenue increase and certain benchmarks across these different revenue increases, you know, and it's cash is cool, right? Cash is king, that makes sense. Everyone loves being paid. Everyone also loves being recognized. So I've done everything as far as, you know, hey, here's a plaque, Mike. You've really just killed it. Here's a plaque engraved with you, engraved with what you've done. Hang this up and be proud. That's cool. Mike, here's a backpack embroidered with your name, filled with some goodies. You know, um, hey, it's January. You guys killed it. And maybe this isn't even numbers based, but like my team worked hard in January. I get it. It's fitness. It's it's a hard part of the year. It's a fun part of the year. But they busted their butts, and it's it's an intense time of year. They're tired. Here's a goodie bag. Here's a you know a care package, if you will. You know, here's a, a day at the spa. Here's um, you know, some candy, here's some coffee, here's some gift cards, things like that. You know, when we talk monetary bonuses and things, I pay those out monthly to my team based on certain buckets that they, that they meet. Um, and I've changed the comp plans over the years. Again, trial and error, right? I've, I've failed many times. Um, it used to be an all or nothing sort of thing. Mike, you hit this number, you win this big bonus, right? You earn this. Well, it doesn't take into account all the other Mm -hmm. buckets and all the other parts of the the business that are equally important so then my team lost sight of all those things because I didn't compensate for those things as a result certain things started to slip you know so in, in stepping back and taking a look and, and really evaluating myself and having that hard conversation with myself it's 
man, I missed the boat on that. That was that was not very intelligent of me to miss the boat. So let's emphasize these certain things. So let's look at member retention. Let's look at, of course, sales. Let's look at staff retention. Let's look at, you know, uh, what are we doing as far as our product sales? Are our product sales, you know, on par with our membership sales? Are they all getting heart rate monitors? Because that's what we do. You know, if we're not selling the product and we can't deliver the service that we promise, we're failing. Mm -hmm. You know, so so ensuring that all of those bonuses and buckets are met on a monthly basis uh, is big. You know, but again, I'm I'm such a huge fan of the the other bonuses that show you know care outside of the paycheck sort mm -hmm. of thing you know i've given away beach cruisers i've given away ipads apple watches you know embroidered backpacks just things that show that you kind of care mm -hmm. uh, go almost further than the money and i say that tongue-in-cheek because everyone loves money but right. it, it shows that you do truly care truly caring about the success of your employees helps build better relations with them which in turn helps keep them for longer the same goes for your members your members have to truly believe that you care about their success and all of their wins. Your prospective members want to see it too. It helps them believe that joining your studio will give them a better chance of succeeding than anywhere else if they see how vested you are in your members' goals. Testimonial videos, case studies, and documenting the successful journeys of your members is a great way to do this. People like sharing their victories and people should be rewarded for their victories. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it's the staff or the members, you know? So I like to highlight that. I'm proud of you for getting to your goals, Mike. I know this is hard. You have a family, you have a business, you have this and that going on in life. I get it. What I wanna do is make this place awesome for you because I'm proud of you for winning. I'm proud of you for getting to your goals. Tell me your story. Everyone's excited to tell their story. That's why there's all these, you know, uh, reality TV shows, and it, and it follows them through because everyone loves a good story. So to be able to allow our members to share their experiences, share their victories, and be proud of what they've accomplished, I'd be doing them a disservice if I didn't allow them to do that. So show a little bit of, you know, the workout before with their coach. You know, have them talking a little bit before. You know, showing pictures of the before. You know, maybe we catch a little bit during, but primarily the after. The after is great because we can show the start, we can show the end. People like measurable results, both as an audience and as a participant. You want to be rewarded for your hard work. If you go to work and you don't get a paycheck, you're not going back. Right. It's the same with the gym. If you show up for two months and you see nothing, I've lost you. Yeah, and that's absolutely. my fault. I'm responsible for your goals. Absolutely. So when we can celebrate those victories and keep you motivated along the way and show these these videos and show the start and show the end and have you talk about how impactful this has been, not only inside the gym, but how much more life, you know, Orange Theory and achieving your goals has given you, that's big. That's really big. Once we have all of the the transformation challenges and um, the before and afters and, and everything that members have accomplished and achieved. Uh, again, people want to be recognized and deserve to be recognized. So that goes out to everyone. A lot of times that'll go into our um, email blast to all of our members at, at, at each individual studio. Because inevitably, if that person is, is winning, people know who that person is. They see them oftentimes, they see them a lot. What else that does, Mike, besides recognizing that member, is that gives hope and motivation to other members. Because now you have a, a mother of four who works full time and you know takes care of the family and the kids and this and that, but she finds four hours a week to come in. And she's down 30 pounds in eight weeks because she's made this a priority and she's put in the effort and she's received the, the guidance and the knowledge and the accountability at Orange Theory. Mm -hmm. Someone else looks at that, sees that, reads that, and says, why not me? These are the types of marketing assets that sell new members into your studios and continue to sell existing members so they stay and refer more to you. But when you have seven studios, you can't be the one doing it. It's a team effort, which brings me back to the importance of having systems in your business that people follow so these things get done without you. And Matt really learned the value of having this set up after two immobilizing injuries that happened within the same two days of each other. Talk about a humbling experience. So I've been working out for 15 years. Um, I do some Orange Theory classes, of course, and I do a lot of bodybuilding. 
Um, I ended up tearing both of my biceps within about a two day time frame. I'm in hard casts, both arms, 90 degrees, locked, hard casts and slings for about 10 days. Literally can't do anything. Can't scratch my nose, can't take a drink, can't eat on my own. Very, very difficult, very humbling. Talk about losing some independence there, yeah. rough. Um, thankfully, my teams that I had in place, nothing skipped a beat on the business side of things. Believe it or not, my business improved uh, during this time, which is, which is a huge credit to my team. Um, truly, they knew I was going through some things and you know, they were able to step up and they were able to improve numbers through this time. Uh, it cool to look back as, as a business owner that I know that I have the right people in place, that I know that they have the right stuff to get things done, even in my absence, which is really, really cool. I'm not saying that I wanna go redo my injury just so my numbers continue to improve, but uh, really nice to see that my team was able to handle business in my absence and continue to do so. After interviewing and meeting with many successful entrepreneurs throughout my career, I've noticed that every single one of them values continued education, not just in fitness, but in business and communication. I had a feeling that if I asked a successful guy like Matt, if he reads each day, I wouldn't be disappointed. I do read a lot mm -hmm. um, and I'm old school, right? I like my, my pen and my highlighter and I like a paper book. One of my all time favorite books and it's so basic is The Compound Effect. Darren Hardy, okay. Compound Effect. Um, and truly just talks about how all of these little things make a huge difference when added up. You know, we talked about you know, how you do one thing, you do all things. You know, if your car is a mess, your, your house is a mess, your life's a mess, I can't, I can't deal with that stuff. But Darren Hardy really breaks it down in this book and talks about how small improvements consistently compound and all of a sudden make big things. Mm -hmm. um, any person who ever asked me for a book to read, any of my new hires, any of my team who wants to improve, wants to get better, you know, on top of the normal books that I do, you know, monthly or quarterly with my teams, that is my go-to because it's so well written and so applicable to business, to life, to relationships, to you know the gym, whatever it is, mm -hmm. breaking those things down and doing it consistently. And the other one I love, believe it or not, is the energy bus. So energy bus for me is really the epitome of my business. It's again, such an easy read, so quick, so basic, but it realigns people's mindset so quickly you know, it talks about energy vampires and people who, you know, suck energy out of the room and out of the business and, and out of the members and out of the other staff members. Don't be an energy vampire. You know, it talks about finding the right seat on the bus for individual people. Maybe they're just not in the right seat and maybe we need to reassign their seat but keep them on the bus and keep them on the team. And it talks about, you know, how energy is everything. And being in this boutique space and in the fitness industry as a whole, energy is everything. Mm -hmm. That's what creates the buying atmosphere in these boutique spaces. If you don't have the energy, you might as well close the doors. You know, that's truly it. I actually wake up every morning and spend at least 30 minutes reading in my office, it's quiet, it's dark, before the world starts, and that's when I do a lot of my reading. Um, and it's daily that I do that, it's really cool. And I, it's kind of my time to you know, set myself up for my day and go from there. Clearly, Matt likes to learn and he likes to learn from the best. So I asked him if he could have dinner with anyone, anyone in the world to learn from, who would it be? I'm a huge, huge Mark Cuban fan. I appreciate everything that he's done, the way in which he interacts and addresses people and obviously the successes that he's had in multiple different arenas and you know the the amount of candidness that he has is just amazing to me but truly I think he's probably the guy that I would be like you you if I can talk to you that's who I want to talk to I've had the pleasure of knowing Matt for a few years now and the conversations I've had with him have always been great and this one is no exception Thanks for watching. If you like this episode, make sure you subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, SoundCloud, Google Play, or YouTube. And to watch more episodes and get exclusive links from each episode, go to gsdshow.com. Again, that's gsdshow.com.